thing about the luncheon. How many of you have ever served with Serve the City? In ever? Well, you're invited to a luncheon after church in the fellowship hall, and Judy will be over there. We're going to have some food, fellowship, um, and she's going to head that up. So please, please, please come by if you've ever served for Serve the City. We believe in being missional as a church, and we believe in multiplying what we do in other places, resourcing, reproducing the goodness of God in other places. Now, we just had a team that came back from Line Fork, Kentucky. How many of you know where Line Fork, Kentucky is? It's a little teeny tiny spot down in South eastern Kentucky, and it no longer even has a post office now. So it's like a, a line on the map, and that's called Highway 160. So um, those of you that are going to be sharing this morning, I would love for you to come up here, and I want to incorporate you in our message on multiplication, okay? Fred, is that uh, microphone there? All right, great. I want to thank Elijah. Did, uh, did you say, did I hear a word that you got stretched? Plenty, plenty. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to start off by, um, by thanking you for being willing to be stretched. Everybody just take your hands like this and go, stretch, okay? Elijah's 17, and I said, Elijah, I want you to lead the team. And I'm going to walk you through and, you know, help you along the way. If you get a little overwhelmed, I'm going to, you know, help you out. But did a great job of putting a lot of things together and making sure that things moved along. So tell us what God did in your life. And well, he's, got a, he's got a sermon here ready. A little bit. Yeah, he's the podium. Look at you, man. So Line Fork was a great opportunity to refresh and renew your spirit because you're away from all the distractions of everyday life and it let you uh, hear God more clearly. And the words he spoke over me that week were serve, lead, stretch, and grow. And by saying yes to leading this, I was stretched plenty of times by leading um, soap discussions, which I've never done before, and having to plan, which... I don't do. <laughs> and um, something I learned about leadership through this week was the best way to lead is by example through obedience and selflessness. And my favorite part of the trip was helping a lady named Judy who hasn't been going to church in a long time because she was offended by somebody in the church and she's been holding unforgiveness for a long time. And unforgiveness is like having a boulder in a rowboat and sooner or later it starts to sink your whole life so throughout the week we blessed her and she blessed us we drywalled her her whole house and ceiling so I got to learn how to do that which was great and then which was better was the meal afterwards <laughs> and um she we, she was so glad we came, and she said nobody's ever done anything that nice for her before. And she sort of had a, um, like a, a bad, um, a bad rep for followers of Christ, and she thought she didn't know what that really looked like, and we were able to emulate, emulate that for her. And she wanted us to promise her that we would come back next year. And um, just being there... Be us blessing her and her blessing us was a great thing. And um, there's just something about going there and seeing the way people live that makes you a lot more thankful for what you have, and it's definitely a humbling experience. And I was glad I was able to go. to Line Fork, I got to learn some new things. I learned how to spackle, how to dig a ditch, how to unlock a car without keys, <laughs> climb a slanted cliff, go on a hike, and more. Doing these things helped me a little more to get connected with God. I loved being able to make people smile 
by doing work or playing games with people. It didn't matter what I did to help, it just mattered that I helped. I also got to experience how easy it is to make a difference. It's the little things we do to make people happy, like playing with them, doing some work on a house, or just sitting down with somebody and truly listening to what they have to say. I had a lot of fun on this trip. Going to Line Fork was a great experience, and I definitely want to go again. Um, when I went to Line Fork, I um, had a spiritual growth, cause, and I became a follower of God, and I, um, I wasn't much of a follower of God before. And I had a lot of fun helping people, and I learned a lot of stuff, like how to use a drill and spackle. And um, I learned how to dig a ditch. And so it was really fun. And it just made me happy putting a smile on people's face, on people's face. Great job. Great job. Thank you, Emma. Well, those are my three, so I was really um, thankful. I brought my four children with me to Line Fork this time, and uh, for me, going to Line Fork was like going back to the basics, both literally and spiritually. There was no TV. We were in the heat all day. We worked hard and spent most of our time in the outdoors, listening to the gurgling of the creek or smelling the smoke from a campfire. I got to see firsthand what it means to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Interestingly, this was the vision that the Lord had given to Elijah before we went, um, that we would in fact be the hands and feet of Jesus to people less fortunate. We cleaned mold off stairs so Mary's grown son, Howard, would be able to get up to his apartment safely. I did insulation for a woman whose home was leaking and her husband and son could not do the work. My daughters and I sat and played board games with children who have known sorrow and trial unlike anything we experience in our peaceful, settled lives. Every time I practiced this, I couldn't do it without crying. I played Uno with Joanna, a 27-year-old woman who was partially paralyzed and had cerebral palsy because she had suffered shaken baby syndrome. It broke my heart to know that someone would hurt a baby, and now this woman, who really acted like a child, was in a wheelchair and barely able to talk for the rest of her life. As I sat next to her and we won our game of Uno, she cheered and laughed and smiled. I looked at her and read her shirt. It said, property of Jesus. And because, Mary, because of Mary's obedience to the Lord's calling to open an orphan home, Joanna knew this love of Jesus. When Joanna saw Durant coming up the lane one day, Mary, her adoptive mother, was trying to get her into the house for supper, but Joanna was adamant. I want to see Durant. I'm going to see Durant. She wheeled over to him, and her face lit up like the sun. Durant gave her a big hug, affirmed her, and smiled his joyful smile at her. She grinned ear to ear, and it was in that moment that I understood why the Lord had brought me to Line Fork. It was to show my children what life is really about. It was to show them what Jesus meant when he said, love one another. They were able to see why God had said this and the simplicity of that calling and the impact on others when you do the basics. Help people, smile at people, care for people, encourage people. John 13 says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. There were challenges with going to Line Fork. The nine-hour drive, the sulfur smell in the water, the bug bites, the fear of being pinned to a porta potty by a bear at three in the morning. <laughs> but I would do it again in a heartbeat. I learned that with God, all things are possible. Matthew 19. Where there was nothing, God built a church and an orphan home. Where there was abandonment, God brought adoption. Where there was sorrow, God brought joy, and where there was hopelessness, God intervened. 
And we got to be a part of his work there, bringing joy, friendship, and helping hands. Through Mary's story and my time there, I learned that one person submitted to the will of God can change the world. And that's what I want to do. Cece, I want you to just stay here for a second. Yeah, give, give the Lord a praise. Because... <laughs> you exemplified what we value here in family ministry. And when you risk taking your four kids along and exposing them to things that you weren't necessarily comfortable with, but hearing the testimony of your kids saying, God changed my life. You see, we believe in intergenerational ministry together. It's not just a, well, the adults do this, the, the tweens do this, and, and you know the teenagers do this, and nary the twain shall meet. And I saw this in this healthy intergenerational discipleship. And I just want to say thank you for risking to take your family on this. And I know this is just a, a new beginning. So Many years of from, support to come. Yes, from, and, and from here to the world, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Okay, where to begin after that? <laughs> that was awesome. Um, uh, I want to talk about a little bit of... Um, I guess, personal healing that God did for me while I was in Line Fork. Um, we had this spiritual assignment where uh, Cece asked us to just go off on our own, find a quiet place, and pray to God and ask him to give us a word that um, he wants us to take away from this trip. And it was, I was, you know, that happened. I was thinking, you know, I'm not going to hear anything. I haven't been feeling God at all this week because, like, just being in Line Fork, doing everything was so challenging. It was not what I was used to at all. So I'm sitting there. And I'm saying, okay, God, I'm not going to move from this rock. And I was sitting on a rock. I'm not going to move from this rock until um, I hear a word from you. I was sitting there. I wasn't hearing anything. I was kind of thinking about some stuff. And then I, like, jumped up and screamed because there were bugs all around me. <laughs> and then uh, I'm, after that, I decided to go uh, walking through the creek. And I was um, scared the whole time because I was afraid I was going to fall and hurt myself. And um, I did, it hurt, <laughs> but it wasn't very bad. And um, after I fell, I kind of realized uh, the word fear was sticking in my mind. And so I told Cece, and she said, fear? That's what he wants you to take away from this trip? So I explained it to her, and um, we thought that fear not was more appropriate. Maybe that's what God was trying to tell me. And um, she told me the verse, Joshua 1.9, uh, do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And I think that kind of opened my eyes to why I um, wasn't getting the most out of the few days that we had been there, because I was so afraid of so many things, and like I was letting all these distractions uh, from life getting into my head. Um, there were small things, like I was afraid of, um, I was afraid of bugs getting me, I was afraid of bears, I was afraid of all these little things. And also, whenever I was sleeping, like, it was so hard to fall asleep because um, I was, you know, scared, you know, where am I going to go to school next year? I was scared, you know, um, you know, just, just all these, like, these big things uh, that I had been worrying about. So when he told me fear or not, I kind of realized, like, it really opened my eyes. Like, I don't really need to worry about what's coming next or what's going to happen because even if I fall on the rocks or even if I go to some school that I've never been to before and I hear the people are really mean or something, uh, God's going to be right there with me and he's always going to be on my side. And that's the same for everybody. Um, and I, when I got back, uh, Pastor told us to read uh, 1 Kings 17, 18, and 19. And uh, right in the beginning, the first thing that stood out to me was when um, uh, God told Elijah to camp out in the wilderness and eat whatever the ravens brought him. And he heard that. He was like, okay, so we went and did it. And I was thinking, that's, like, that's crazy. I could never do that. I was thinking, what if there's no ravens? You know, what if they just bring me, like, dead bugs or something? I'm not going to eat bugs. So, you know, whether or not Elijah was afraid, he still did it because he knew that God was protecting him. And I think, that's, um, I think that's the biggest thing that I took away from this, and that probably, you know, some people in here might need to know as well, is that, um, is that like, even if you're afraid, you don't need to let those fears, um, they can't, like, overpower your faith in God, because, 
Like God can overcome anything, no matter what the fear is, no matter what may or may not be coming your way. Um, that's just, you know, that's what he showed me is that we're in his arms and he's going to keep us safe. So. Do it afraid, Pastor Sherry would say. Do it afraid. Do it afraid. Okay, so I'm afraid. (laughs) God, I want to pray over everyone in this building right now who may be struggling with fear or fear may be coming their way. And just comfort them so that they'll know that they're in your arms and you'll be keeping them safe, that you know exactly what's best for them and that they can rest knowing that. Because ultimately you are... You're the best comforter, the best savior, the best friend anybody could know. So I'm praying that whatever fears people in here may be having, that they'll be able to put it aside and have faith knowing that and have faith knowing that you'll do what's best for them and keep them safe along the way and give them more than what they're wanting. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Excellent job. Wow. I am glad that I followed that because I am totally petrified being up here today. But once, once again, God has given me another something to process. Every time I try to think about my trip to Line Fork this past couple of days, ever since we got back, um, I started crying. I'm like, Lord, Lord, please help me. I, I can't break down in front of these people. It's just not cool, okay? But everything, I mean, even before we started the trip to Line Fork, a couple days before, I didn't tell anybody, but I seriously was talking my way out of this trip. I'm like, I'm, I'm, this, I'm this old my my body cannot do these things. I know I'm going to be asked to do things I've never done in my life, and I'm going to fail. And I'm like, and all of a sudden God says, you know, you got to go because I'm going to show you some things about people and about yourself that are going to totally freak you out, and you are going to so you're going to so love the Lord so much more you're going to be so much more faithful to him you are going to even transform people as close as your family members you're just going to be able to stretch yourself so much farther and go ahead and go so i did and we dug ditches and we put insulation on and I was attacked by 47,000 insects that if you could, I'm not going to show you my legs, but they are a mess, okay? That's why I'm wearing a very, very long skirt today, okay? And um, there's just things i would never done before. I relied on other people to do them for me. I relied on... God to this time to free me up to step outside my comfort zone, which when I got up on Saturday morning and I sat with my dog on the couch and I looked around my house and I looked out my back door and I saw, and the fact that I could go to the bathroom and it wasn't in the middle of the night, and I was afraid that bears were going to get me. Um, I was so happy. I was the happiest person in the world, okay? But I started crying, and I'm like, wow, I am so blessed, right? I am the most blessed person, and God has shown me how to be humble and to do things without question when he says, 
Go and put some drywall up. Okay. Go use a weed whacker that's going to electrocute you. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead and take a hike into, I don't even know, it was <laughs> falls and I just, I don't get it. It just, I am so blessed. The team, the team that I was with, they just, they, they lifted me up. When I thought that I could not do things, they lifted me up. And I know God was there every single step of the way because, you know, there were things that they were asking me to do that, you know, I'd never done before. I had never done everything the whole entire trip. I'd never done any of it, you know. So I had a very sheltered life, so I'm okay with that. But he stretched me, and I am so thankful that I have gone. And if this is the first, the only time that I go, or the hundredth time that I will go, you know, I'm just thankful and blessed that I was able to be with the people that I was with, and that God just showed us some things that were just life transforming. I will never, ever be the same again because of what God did in that little place in Line 4, Kentucky. So. Okay, funniest part of the whole trip. She alluded to it with the electrifying weed eater. <laughs> so I was fixing weed eaters, and uh, the glorious job of Sally wanted to weed eat. She had never weed eaten before. And uh, so I get her the goggles, you know, and I get her the steel weed eater. Now, the weed eater did not have the little rubber plug that covers the um, uh, spark plug, you know, on the, on the back. And so she's, she's going along, and she would rev the, rev the weed eater, and it was like just barely going, you know. It was like you could hear it going shh, 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 instead of, ee, you know, it was like. And, I'm, and, and every time she would start to do it, she'd start to jump. And I, and, I, and I thought, now that's the strangest thing because I know there's not stuff hitting her legs. It's not going fast enough. And, and she would, she would hit, the, hit the trigger and then she'd look around like in the back, like, what's going on? What's going on? <laughs> finally, finally I realized she's, a, she's got a sweaty arm laying on a spark plug and she, every time she hits it, it arcs to her arm instead of the thing and she's just... So, so I'm, like, I'm having an electrifying experience she, with Laura. Yeah, she, one, one word, electrifying. That was a... <laughs> so, but you persevered through. I fixed the weed eater, and it was a whole new experience after that, right? God bless you. God bless you. <laughs> for that rubber cap. <laughs> so... <laughs> okay. I, I just want to say to all of the team that went, that you guys, in, in doing things by faith rather than doing things by your ability, I am very proud of you. And, you know, particularly Zoe, Zoe and Emma, Zoe, Zoe, Zoe and Emma, uh, man, you just rose to the challenge and took on anything that was thrown your direction. Sally, you know, yeah, I can't, but I can. What was that 2,860 foot bullock overlook? It wasn't like straight down, but it was above sea level. And I'm like, Sally, you can walk out on this overlook. No, I can't, no, I can't. Yes, you can. I 100% guarantee your safety. How's that, you know? So, uh, you know, she by faith walked out there and did something she said she couldn't do. And Nan, I cited you as we were going up the windy two-lane road that was barely wide enough for one lane. I said, if Nan can do it, you can do it. So, you know, it's good to be able to disciple people even when you're not there. So, <laughs> testimonies, testimonies, testimonies. Okay, tweens, tweens. If you're a tween, you guys can zippity-doo up there to uh, follow Cece. And uh, we're going to talk about multiplication again. Now, this is a, uh, a three-legged stool. Some of you are very familiar with my three-legged stool. If you've been here 12 years ago in a leadership meeting, I set this stool down uh, in the upper room. And the three legs, anybody remember what the three legs uh, represented if you were in that meeting? Leadership, 
evangelism, and discipleship. Now, I won't, well, I will tell you. The children's director at the time, Patty said, that thing's a three-legged booty plopper. So I don't know what that is, but it, forever when I look at that, I think of Patty. And um, I want you to think about these three areas. Leadership, evangelism, and discipleship as three legs that we must incorporate into our life as individuals and as a church if we are to multiply. Now, there's some people that say, well, I don't do that evangelism thing. You know, I don't, I don't talk to people because I'm a discipler. Well, well guess, guess what? If you don't have anybody coming to Christ who are you going to disciple? Oh, I'm a discipler. Well, where are your disciples? Well, they haven't come by yet. Well, don't, don't you think that you need to maybe go and tell people about this Jesus that you want them to instinctively follow? You know, that's a good idea. Oh, I'm an evangelist. You know, I just catch them and you clean them. That's the fish analogy, okay. Uh, so, so you... I'll get them and throw them into your boat and then you clean them up. I don't want anything to do with them after they say the sinner's prayer. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a leader, Pastor, and I don't have time for all this serving the folks so that they come to Jesus stuff. You know, let me just lead them. Put me in a position and let me lead. Now, if you're out of balance, what happens if one of these legs does not work? Just Throw something out there. What do you think is going to happen? I'm going to fall. Now, if you look at this closely, there's one of these legs that is a reconstructed leg. Thirteen years ago, I sat on this thing as a youth pastor, and it broke. I told Bob I was going to have him come up and test it to see if the new leg worked, but he didn't like that idea. And so my neighbor made another leg so that it would once again be a three-legged stool and support my weight. Sometimes in our life, one of the areas gets out of whack, evangelism, discipleship, or leadership, and it gets broke, and we have to reevaluate. It's a continual cycle for a healthy life and for a healthy church. Otherwise, we multiply, but if one leg's longer than the other, you're kind of sitting crooked, and you're not, it, it doesn't work very well. I want to continue looking at Luke. And Luke chapter 5, verses 27 through 32 is where I want to start. If, uh, if you've been reading the church reading plan, you have been there, you've read this this week. Luke 5, 27 to 32. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector. Now let me pause there for a moment. I am kind of, I'm kind of tight. Okay, I, I don't like spending money. Yesterday, I was in the grocery store and we were getting something that was $4. I don't even remember what it was. I just remember, I was thinking, we don't need that. That's unnecessary. No, we don't. And, you know, I'm, I'm married to a woman that is also thrifty. Praise God for that because if she wasn't, I don't know what I would do. But I don't like spending money. I don't like wasting money. And I certainly don't enjoy, this is not a political statement, okay, but it's going to sound like one. I certainly don't enjoy paying taxes that go to things that I don't believe in. Now, this man is a tax collector. He is an IRS agent that has his own agenda as well as the people that he is collecting taxes for. He's out there and he says, okay, you owe $45. Let's just make it a round, even figure. $50 will be good. And five goes to me, 45 goes to the government. And I'll line my pockets with that. He is hated by everyone. Tax collectors, the low of the low. All right. A tax collector by the name of Levi, sitting at his tax booth. He's in his office. And when Jesus saw him, he said, follow me. 
And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. And Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors, not just one tax collector, but a whole bunch of crooked guys, all in the same place. And they were eating with them. But the Pharisees, those are the religious folk of the day, and they looked out and they're like, mm, 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 Jesus eating with them, he's one of them. Mm-hmm. I knew sooner or later he was going to have to get his support from somewhere. So he goes to the crooked people and he puts a guilt trip on them and they give him money and then he doesn't have to work and he goes around doing his teaching miracle thing, that little dog and pony show. That's not... the, the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belong to the sect complain to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors? And he labels them sinners. And Jesus answered, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Could we say that together? Let's just read that. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Then Jesus says, I have come to call not the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. I got a, uh, a Facebook message from Rich Jorgensen this morning. I'm just going to read it. Something wonderful happened this morning. Now, this is there ahead of us by six hours in Niger. I was doing my four-mile morning run, and Ed, you know where we run down from there? And we met a young man who was also exercising. And he, we got to talking, and I invited him to church. And he came and heard God's word from Pastor Eero, one of the pastors in the uh, village churches there in, in Niger. And at the end of the service, walked boldly up to the front and gave his life to Jesus. Now, remember, this is a 97% Muslim country. Please pray for Ibrahim because there will be persecution. Pray that he grows into a strong Christian. Now, he just sent me a message this week saying, pray for the church in Niger or in Nigeria, which is right south of them, because there are hundreds of Christians that are being slaughtered right now, this week. Boko Haram is there. ISIS is over in the other. If you're following these kind of things, it is a massive genocide that is going on right now in Africa and the Middle East. Very systematic. Here's a man that says, I am going to follow Jesus even though it's going to cost me my family. When they find out that I am a Christian, I will be disowned. See, that's the kind of leave everything, follow me, we're going this direction. Now, what if Rich would have said, you know, hey, I'm just out here on my run, and I just want to, you know, it's me and Jesus time. Uh, if I remember correctly, the military trained in that same area, and so you'd have the, the soldiers doing their PT coming up and down the same route that we were running, and I just want to just, I want to just pray in tongues the whole way. I just want to pray and just enjoy my time. I don't want to talk to anybody. This young man would not be a Christian right now had he had that focus on evangelism, or not had that focus on evangelism. If he said, my responsibility is in the Bible school, I train the pastors, and guess what? They go out and do what they do. No, he said, it's my responsibility. It's my responsibility. Would your testimony fit right in here? Uh, come, up, come up. She, had a, she has a testimony. I, I was, I was in, in Line Fork, and we were talking. Uh, there's somebody that I've been praying for for 20 years. And in 20 years, I've spent hours and hours with this guy who is, a, I believe, a key to that valley down there. And in the last six months, he started going to church. His mother's been part of the church. He's my age. He started going to the church. And I said, 
you know what? I need to spend some time with this guy. Because sometimes the worst sinners make the best followers of Jesus. Go ahead, Nancy, and share your everyday life story of what God, yeah, experienced. Okay. Yep, you're um, I guess after the testimonies of Line Fort, I kind of had an aha moment as to why God put it on my heart to share this testimony today. Because it didn't just happen. Um, actually, it happened 27 years ago. But um, I didn't realize... I didn't even realize that it happened until a couple of months ago. Um, when my daughter was a senior in high school, I worked for the superintendent of schools, uh, and our office was in the high school. My daughter came to me one day, running in my office, just frantic, and she said, Mom, something's wrong with Terry. I don't know what's wrong with him. He's just acting really, really bizarre. Something's, something's really wrong. And I said, and of course, my first instinct working with teenagers, is it drugs? She said, no, it's not drugs. There's, there's just something really wrong. So I went out and I got Terry and I brought him back to the office. And she was right. And I knew it was not drugs. It was, I knew it was a, a mental illness issue. Um, and he was just frantic and, and just talking crazy. And so I just sat him down and I talked to him for a few minutes. I called his mother to come get him and just kept talking to him until she got there. Now I had totally forgotten about this, but I feel like there's somebody in church today that's feeling like they've never done anything for anybody, especially after these testimonies from Line Fork. You know, oh, I've never done that. I could never do that. And I just don't feel like I've ever made a difference. Well, let me tell you, a couple months ago, my daughter came to me and she said, guess who I ran into? I ran into Terry. I said, oh, I just love that kid. That kid, he's, you know, 40-something now. I said, how's he doing? She said, well, you know, he's still dealing with a lot of the issues. It turns out that that year he was not only struggling with his sexuality, but he was also diagnosed schizophrenic at 17 years old. And... I kind of had an inkling, you know, that something seriously was wrong. But I said, well, how's he doing now? She said, well, he's still dealing with it. He's still living at home. Um, he's still having a lot of problems. But I have to tell you what he said to me. He said, how's your mom? And I'm thinking, oh, my word, I can't even believe this kid even remembered me. And Stacy said, she's, she's doing okay. And he goes, you know, she saved my life. And I'm like, Really? You know, all I did was sit and talk to the kid, called his mom. You never know. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not relaying this story for any glory or anything because I didn't even know I did it. But there's somebody that's feeling like you've not made a difference. And trust me, you have made a difference. You may not ever find out what it was. It may take 27 years to find out what it was. But even if you can't do the big things like go to Line Fork or... Um, anything like that, do any missions trips or anything, please believe that you're still making a difference. You're still making a difference when you talk to people and you disciple to people. You're multiplying. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I want you to think of the worst sinner that you know. Who's the worst Sinner that you know. <laughs> you, yeah. Some of us are raising our hands like, man, you know what? I know me better than all. But I want you to look at it from this perspective. Don't give up on the worst sinner that you know, even if it's you. Don't give up on them. Think of the Apostle Paul. What would have happened if God would have given up on this guy named Saul from Tarsus who was persecuting the church even unto death imprisoning people, and he said, nope, I'm not giving up on him. Matter of fact, I am going to come in on this guy's life so hard, he's going to have a wake-up call. I'm going to spin his life around. I'm going to send him out for three years into the desert to get a little bit of reprogramming, and I'm going to bring him back, and he's going to write a book. Matter of fact, he's going to write several books, and we're going to compile them together, and it's going to change the world forever. 
See, I had given up on, on what, who we know as the Apostle Paul, but God didn't. But we're sinners even make the best leaders when they're discipled by transformed followers of Jesus. Some of you think, well, I'm not a great leader. But God puts you in contact with one person that you will make a difference in their life and that person will grab the baton and they will run with it and you'll be saying, wow, they're an amazing leader and my thumbprint of discipleship is on them. You don't know the difference that you'll make in the Terry's lives and the Todd's lives and whoever else it is that you're imparting into in that area of evangelism. So here's a challenge for you. Think about who God is asking you to call into a following relationship with Jesus. You know, as you follow Christ, there's going to be people around you that simply saying, simply inviting them on the journey with you is going to be enough. There's other people that you'll pray for for 20 years, like Todd. Praying, praying, and praying, God, save Todd because he's going to be such an influencer in this community. You know, if Todd gets saved, he knows people within a 100-mile radius. This is going to be transformational. And nothing's happening, nothing's happening. And 20 years later, I'm sitting at his kitchen table saying, I think there's a glimmer here of God doing something in his life. Now, this second thing of, of discipleship, where Mark chapter 3 and verse 14, it says, he, Jesus, appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. Now, in discipleship, when somebody comes uh, to Christ and they say, I want to be a follower of Christ, that person then has a decision to make, am I going to continue to follow or am I going to bail out? Interesting, there aren't many 66 verses in the Bible. But John chapter 6, verse 66, John 666, okay, it says, For this time, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Jesus teaching got a little bit hard, called for a little bit of change, and they said, Whoa, man, we didn't, it's particularly when he started talking about eating my flesh and drinking my blood, what we know is communion. He's like, hey, I, we, we don't want this kind of thing. We're out of here. We're done. Have you known any followers that stopped early? It's sad, isn't it? But in our discipleship process, God wants us to finish strong. That, that we will say as faithful disciples, yes to our calling. We're going to do this all the way to the end. You know, I've made a commitment to God to say, I don't care what it is that you ask me to do. I'm going to do it with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength until I can no longer breathe. My answer is yes before I know what the question is. Now, I don't know where that's going to take me. I don't know what's going to happen in my life. But I can tell you this. My answer is yes as a follower because I want to finish well. Anybody else want to finish well? <laughs> I want to finish well till I draw my last breath. I want to be saying yes, 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 all the way until I cross that threshold into eternity. Mary Bennett, uh, the lady that we served with down there in Line Fork, tells her story of how God took her from Line Fork, born there, to California to a very successful career in Los Angeles and said, I'm never going back to that place. And she ended up going to Bible college, and at the end, she was like, I'm going to be a missionary in Korea. Foursquare said, you're approved to go to Korea. And the Lord spoke to her and said, Mary, I want you to go back and pastor a church in your hometown, Line Fork, Kentucky. Now, is that like anticlimactic or what? Like, here, I'm, I'm going to be a missionary in Korea. I want you to go back home where there is nothing and I want you to plant a church. 
I want you to pastor a church there. Are you kidding me, God? But, you know, she had come to the place where she said yes. And this was interesting. I had not heard this as part of her testimony before. She said, I believe that God called a man to go back there and pastor that church. And the man said no. And she said, I was God's second choice to go and pastor that church. But I said yes, because he asked. And she's been there for 40 years, pastoring the church and running the children's home, touching thousands of people in a ripple effect that has literally gone around the world and certainly into eternity. Would you say yes in your discipleship process? You know, say yes to evangelism. Whoops. Say yes. See what happens if you get out of bounds? Yes to evangelism. Yes, 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 Lord, whatever you say, I'm going to grow. And then be willing to go into this third leg, and that is leadership. Luke chapter 6, back to Luke 6, verses 12 to 15. One of those days, Jesus went to a mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him, and he chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. And we know, we know them. We call them the 12 disciples, but really they're the 12 apostles because he had a whole bunch of disciples, but he calls these to them to him, those who had been faithful, those who hadn't la- uh, just quit. And he says, I want you to be my leaders. And we particularly follow Peter, James, John, some of the others that, uh, that took up that mantle and said yes. In Acts chapter 5, Luke continues to write, and he says in verse 12, the apostles performed signs and wonders among the people. In Corinthians, Paul writes, he says, I I, uh, persevered in demonstrating among you the marks of a true apostle, including signs and wonders and miracles. Now, when you're leading, be prepared for the supernatural. I don't think you heard that. When you're leading, be prepared for the supernatural. Here was one of the interesting things that I saw when we were on the Line Fork team. They mentioned the keys. We, uh, somebody set their keys down on the, on the, on the um, seat, and somebody else locked the door, not knowing that the keys were there, and, and boom, the door's closed. Hallelujah. We have no cell coverage at all. We are in the middle of nowhere. Have no idea how many hours or days it would take AAA to find us. There isn't even an address for the place that we are. Okay? It's like there. It's and, and so immediately I'm thinking contingency plans. You ever get there? Okay, contingency plans. Yes, we can walk to a phone somewhere. We'll get a landline. We'll see if we can call and maybe stand somebody out alongside the road and flag them down, you know, whatever it is. And before I knew it, the Lord had given a couple of our, our young men a plan, and in about 30 minutes, they must have played a lot of Grand Theft Auto, but they had that thing open. <laughs> now, to me, I've been a car guy all my life, all right? And praise God that Jerry Young had locked his keys in his car out here in the parking lot one time because the idea that these guys had was exactly what the professional used. And I was able to stand back and watch and say, did they figure that out on their own or was that a God idea? Because I watched the professional do that on Jerry's Cadillac, okay? No airbags blew up either. I mean, it was just great. But you see, the supernatural to me happens in the everyday life when you see God doing stuff like, you know, that shouldn't be happening right now, but it is. And as a leader, I rejoice at seeing God at work. Because I can tell you this, I can't lead by my own strength. Anybody say amen to that? Man, we need the power of God in our life for that. We need it for evangelism. You will be my witnesses when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, Acts 1 and 8. And as we grow in our relationship with him, we've got to have the power of God in us. But as we lead, 
Let's expect the signs and wonders and miracles so that we can multiply the kingdom of God in our generation, in our time. God has entrusted the kingdom to us for this season. Personally, don't think that's a very good idea, knowing how we, who we are, who I am, how we're made up, but he thinks it's a great idea to empower flawed individuals to lead people to following Jesus and to growing. Love hearing your testimonies of growth, line 14. Man, it's great. Don't stop. Keep going. And let's lead well. Evangelism, discipleship, and leadership. And in that, we multiply what we know as the kingdom of God. I want to close with this. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. Talking about the, the church at that time, the forming of the church. This is really the birth of the church after, uh, after Acts uh, 2, when the coming of the Holy Spirit... It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. And they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day... They continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You have all of the elements there of the three-legged booty plopper. People are getting saved. You have evangelism. People are growing in relationship and fellowship one with another. Their lives are being transformed in community. We are Coastlands Community Church for a reason. Because in community, we grow. And then it's said that there were apostles that were leading with signs and wonders and miracles. And then the cycle starts all over again because more people were getting saved and added to the church so that they could be discipled in community so that more people could be sent out. So the greater things would happen and more people would be getting saved. And the church grew and grew and grew and multiplied in effectiveness. And we are a result of that cycle. Multiply. Now, wherever you are in strength, maybe you have one leg that's stronger than the other and you say, man, I, I got this leadership thing down, but I really need to grow in evangelism. Would you just ask God today for those opportunities to share his name with people? Maybe the question, just tell me about your satisfying relationship with Jesus. And if they say, you know, I, I have no clue what you're talking about, well, then you know where to start. If they say, you know, I, I have a relationship with Jesus, but it's really not satisfying, then you may be able to enter into that discipleship part. And they're gonna have, you're going to encounter some people that are just so on fire for God and they have no place to let it out. Or they feel they have no place to let it out. And you say, have I got a place for you? We got this pushy pastor that'll just help you right into the fray of things. You know, stretch. So let's evaluate. Let's evaluate our life. Evangelism, discipleship, leadership. I already said last week, my, my, weakness, my weakness is the evangelism side. And I'm asking God, God, open these doors. And you know what? He takes me up on it right away in the first week that I, that I pray the prayer. Voila! Can you imagine that? Gives me those opportunities. So I want us to... I want us to um, to make a commitment to the Lord today. And I want you to pick one of these three areas that, that would be your area of, your weakest area. And I, and I want you to agree with me today that the Lord would fortify that, give you those opportunities to grow and to stretch. 
And so let's just take 10 or 15 seconds. Is it evangelism? Is it your personal growth, growth and discipleship? Or is it your fear of leadership? Without making it public, but when you've identified one where you'd like the Lord to touch you, I want you to just stand right where you are. God, grace, grace upon these areas, Lord. I, I need your help. I need your Holy Spirit to intervene today, right now. So Lord, greater than ever, we need a move and a multiplication of your presence, your power, your, your community, your family in our generation, in our city, in our nation. Lord, we need it. And you're going to use the people right here in this room to do it. Just lift your hands with me and say, empower me, Holy Spirit. Say those words out loud. Empower me, Holy Spirit, in this area of need. Empower me, Holy Spirit, in this area of need. Fill me, Lord, to overflowing. I receive it now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, don't be surprised when God takes you up on what you ask because he will. He'll give you those opportunities when you least expect them. And he'll say, oh, by the way, remember Sunday? Don't worry, I got this. Watch me work. And you smile just like Sally's smiling now because you, say, <laughs> because you know when you get on the other side of it that it was a God thing. So I release you today in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.